Good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm Mandy Carter, Woodhall board member. I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Rachel O'Leary Carmona. For more than a decade, Women's March Executive Director, Rachel O'Leary Carmona has helped to inspire, equip, and mobilize people to shape the actions and policies that affect their communities. Rachel established herself as a recognized expert in building transformational online and offline communities and networks. She previously worked with Amnesty International USA, Women for Women International, Girl Scouts of the USA, the Gay Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, GLAD, Wisconsin Public Television, and with the mayor's offices in Madison, uh, I'm sorry, with the mayor's offices in Memphis, Tennessee, and Somerville, Massachusetts. Before accepting the executive director role at the Women's March, Rachel spent nearly three years serving as the chief operating officer. Rachel earned her associate's degree from Madison Area Technical College. She went on to earn her bachelor's degree in African American Studies from the University of Wisconsin and her master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School Government, where she focused on leadership, development, and nonprofit management. Now let's hear from Rachel. Hi, everybody. Good morning. How is everyone? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you to give me some, some level of this because I'm zooming in from Amarillo, Texas, where I tested negative for COVID the first time yesterday, <laughs> as I'm sure uh, some of you can relate to. Um, otherwise, I would be there with you in person. But um, yeah, we're still in the middle of uh, actually, two pandemics now um, officially this week. So um, thought better safe than sorry. So, so, um, so this is what we can use because some of the, um, you know, the audio is a little funny because of our uh, setup here. But we're going to make it work a little bit like what's going on in the country. We're just going to make it work. Like not everything is set up for us, but we're going to we, we got it anyway. Um, so thank you so much, and thank you for that warm welcome. Um, I, uh, I, I'm here to talk to you today about a number of things, including resilience and hope and how we're going to win, um, examples of, of how we've won, et cetera. Um, and uh, um, if you're like me, uh, you, you know, kind of Google folks, and I had that, that good introduction, but I also wanted to just talk to you a little bit about how I, how I came to be sitting in front of you today. Um, before I start, because I'm always kind of like, hmm, I agree with them, so I'm going to Google them under the table while I'm listening, or I disagree with them, and so I'm going to Google them under the table um, while they're talking. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, as my bio said, I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and, um, you know, was a, a product of public schools there. My um, father was an immigrant to this country. Um, I'm a first generation American. Uh, and I spent the first three years after high school as a domestic worker, um, you know, working in, in um, you know, wealthy folks' homes um, and cleaning them. And I think that's the moment um, where I was radicalized um, and, and really um, became very clear uh, about the conditions for folks um, in this country. And whatever freedom we're talking about, um, whether it's sexual freedom or, or any other kind, um, under having an understanding of politics, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, um, I think is the, the, the basis and the foundation of um, any one of us getting free in any way. Um, understanding how we are all linked, um, how none of us are going to get free independently, um, how none of us can actually struggle for freedom um, independently, um, and the ways in which um, we need to modify and change some things um, in order to win. There's this uh, cartoon I really like. 
and it's in when I had an office pre pre pandemic when I had an office it's been in all of my offices and um, th there's this cartoon and and there's a group of people and there's like a leader talking to the people and the leader says how many people want change and everyone's hands in the air you know and then um, the second little panel says and how many people want to change and everyone's like looking around and, and, and no one is volunteering and so I think that part of what we, you know, are contending with as um, a movement, um, as people who are aligned, is that we want change, but um, finding our way to change um, is is hard um, and remains hard. Uh, and I think that's one of the tasks in front of us. And so, you know, a lot of my career and life has been characterized by change, from changing from you know, a domestic worker into a student going to, um, you know, college at, uh, you know, my, getting my associate's degree to a four-year university. Um, and then, of course, um, being out in the working world, um, you know, doing this uh, social justice work, which is very privileged work to do, um, you know, and then and then finishing up at Harvard. Not, not very many people start their careers um, cleaning floors on their hands and knees and end up at Harvard. And so it can give you a little bit of whiplash. But also a really good perspective, um, you know, uh, to to you know, and perch from which um, to approach the work. So um, that's a little about me. As we were running through the jobs, I was like, "Oh my God, it sounds like I can't, I can't stick with a job." Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, I've been very lucky to do a lot of um, amazing and diverse work across the spectrum of organizations and political movements in homes um, more will which we will talk about a little bit more um, and uh, and I think that that helps to inform how I think about the work um, which is really that we're in a difficult time um, and that without a lot of people doing a lot of work in a lot of varied um, ways, in ways that are both similar and dissimilar to each other, um, we don't have the chance at winning. We can't shift the conditions to win. So that's my little um, preamble, um, I guess. And before I get too far in, I want to just say thank you to everyone for having me um, and thinking here. I know it's early um, and and for contending with and being willing to grapple with the work on Saturday. Um, we're, we're always making choices about um, how we spend our time. Uh, we could all be elsewhere, you know, shopping or working in the garden or spending time with family or friends or, you know, going for a run around the lake somewhere or, you know, what have you. Um, and instead, you all are here trying to figure out how to best um, skill up um, and, and get a network ready to um, figure out how to advance, um, you know, sexual freedom. And I think that that is... Um, really amazing. Um, when I used to live in Boston, um, one of the things that I used to ask people is if they knew who Paul Revere was. So how many people in the room with a, with a show of hands, how many people have heard of Paul Revere and the Midnight Ride? So um, how many people know, same show of hands, how many people know what Paul Revere's day job was? One, one set possibly a strong Boston presence there. <laughs> so Paul Revere was a very skilled silversmith. And if you live in Boston, you can see his work um, all over, all over. Um, and the Midnight Ride um, and what he did there, that was his volunteer work. <laughs> and so it's just really important. I like to center myself there and constantly remember that we can make very significant interventions in ways that are both um, our full-time job and our um, volunteer job. And then the addendum to that is that um, actually there were a lot of women involved um, in the organizing and execution of the Midnight Ride whose um, participation has been completely invisibilized. And so that's my little my, my little epilogue to that um, story there is that um, also make sure like, you know, to reach for, for the full facts, the full set of facts. Um, so before we get in, before you can even start to talk about prop like solutions, um, I think it's really important to get clear on the problem, you know, um, and we are sitting in a, a nested series of problems that have um, 
some known solutions and some unknown solutions. And so the current, you know, the situation that we're in right now is a tough one. Um, I, I see <laughs> I see this quote all over Twitter, um, as you'll probably hear from this. I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I'm very online. Um, but I've seen people say a number of times, like, well, I'm tired of living in unprecedented times. <laughs> um, and that we are doing. Um, each week there is a new thing. Um, obviously, this last week it was a, a monkeypox public health um, crisis. Um, but if we're talking about school shootings or we're talking about attacks on trans people, we're talking about attacks on bodily autonomy and women, or we're talking about um, rollbacks around, um, you know, gun protections or immigrants. Um, we really, truly are living in very unprecedented times. Um, and for many of us, uh, for our different communities where we come from, whether that is, you know, we were queer or we're trans or we're women in certain states um, or, you know, whatever that looks like for us, um, they're dangerous times. Um, at, lives are on the line. Um, and many, for many of our communities, lives have been on the line for a long time. Um, and there's a truth that we must face um, that is a tough truth to face, which is that we're not going to win what we lost back overnight. And that there's no single strategy and there's no magic bullet that can undo the damage that has been done. Um, the moment requires all of us to bring our best and highest contribution to using, you know, everything that we have um, to the fight, everything in our toolbox. Um, and it's important to recognize the difficulty because until we understand the, the, the scope of the problem, we cannot, um, we cannot arrive on, on the solution. I think there has to be an analysis um, along with the prescription um, so that we're clear that this is why we should do the things that we do. Um, because the doing the things that we do and the things that we need to change to do to win um, will be difficult processes. And sometimes struggle without any clear reasoning for struggle can get us further mired in our silos um, that stops us from building the biggest um, constituency possible. So. When we're talking about difficult and dangerous times, I mean, I think what the political reality is, is that we've got two very important years coming up. Obviously, we're in one of them, 2022 and 2024. Um, and there are a lot of outcomes that we have seen play out, um, you know, in the Supreme Court and other places that have determined what kind of country and future um, we will be as a people, as a as a government um, by and for the people, allegedly. Um, and the outcomes of these two years um, and the work of our movements is really going to determine whether we are a racist authoritarian state um, or a one that is moving with a new American majority towards, um, you know, towards the promise of our democracy um, and, and our founding principles. Um, what has what has happened is that a number of extremists have worked for many decades actually um, to craft a platform that works to keep them in power in ways that are deeply undemocratic. And we saw this recently with the with the road decision where um, and I want to say it was seventy eight percent of all Americans um, did not want Roe overturned, including 60% of Republicans. And um, and yet it was overturned by an unelected court, um, you know, with a lifetime appointment, uh, three of whose justices were put in there by a president who did not win the, the, the popular vote. Um, so we see a platform um, by, you know, advancing through a radical right wing um, fringe that can't win on merits, can't win fair and square, can't win at the ballot box. So how is it going to win? It's going to win by lying, cheating, and stealing. And we see, um, you know, we know the stolen part. <laughs> We've been, we, we are watching trials about it. Um, we are seeing what's happening with respect to our election integrity. Um, lying, we see that all the time. We're not, we're not 
so clear on what that means or, or where everything is because the disinformation machine online is now so sophisticated that it is in fact really hard to, to discern between what is real and what is fake. Um, but we've seen it around um, issues with COVID, issues with monkeypox, issues with the election, issues with voter registration. We saw recently, I'm going to talk a lot about Kansas and what just happened in Kansas, um, but we saw misinformation and disinformation in Kansas being spread not only via online online um, you know, platforms, but being texted to people's individual phones from bad actors who are trying to um, unclear the waters, to muddy the waters for voters so that they were confused about what they were voting for and how to vote. Um, and so we know that there are there is this process of um, you know this agenda that can't win on merit, can't win fair and square, that folks are trying to codify and cement. And the thing about this dangerous moment is that in that cementing, um, it will be very difficult to um, do the the pieces that have um, been cemented. As we see in the Supreme Court, we've got three justices um, that are there for life now, um, and so we need to stop um, the progress of this agenda um, in the ways that we can and begin to roll back the ways in which it has already encroached into our rights and our lives um, as a movement. And so what does that mean? What does that take? Um, you know, like, I think um, the piece about the, the right <laughs> and, and extremists is that they don't litmus test. They're very committed to organizing. Um, they have a very strong commitment to organizing. And so it's like, mm, you're a little disaffected, you're a little bit racist, you're a little bit homophobic, transphobic, come on, you know, come on in and we're gonna organize you into the rest. We're gonna radicalize you through our processes, through our formal and informal organizing networks, through our misinformation and disinformation campaigns. We are going to get you where we need you to be and we're not going to expect you to be there. And that is a little bit where the right and the left differ. Um, and so we, you know, need to make a commitment, an ideological commitment that I think the left has not quite yet made to say that we need to build the biggest constituent we possible to stop this moment, to stop this march towards, you know, authoritarianism that has stripped away our rights um, so, so brutally um, just in the last few months alone. Um, and, uh, and that commitment will look like going from the left, most of the left, to actually being willing to reach into moderate um, conservative spaces and saying, where we find common cause, where we find common purpose, where we um, can build power together that we should do so and not um, uh, build silos that keep us far away from each other, both as people and then as people who sometimes organize ourselves into different um, political homes and movements. And the reason why that's necessary is that we're just so we have so much more in common and we may have um, political difference with people. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat that, but what we have in common with other working people um, is so much more than what we have in common with millionaires and billionaires who are trying to put this radical agenda into place um, to solidify their power. Um, you know, that, that, you know, has very little to do with, you know, the way that we live and love and work um, and even die in this country. Um, when my when my father passed away last year, it, it cost us thousands of dollars to um, you know to to deal with the services because capitalism um, has invaded and corrupted every aspect of our lives from from it costing tens of thousands of dollars to have a baby to you know the costs to um, you know to bury a loved one to to go through the you know those processes and everything in between, between crushing student loan debts or um, inaffordable health care, inequitable, um, you know, um, worker wages for workers, um, you know, and, and the, the very real costs that, um, you know, our community space um, for just being us, for just living our lives and being us at work and, and moving through the world as who we are. So, um, so we need a bigger we and we need a bigger us. Um, I, I think a lot about Harvey Milk's speech where he said, you know, we have to um, elect more of us. Um, we, have to, we have to serve the us's because without, without having a focus on the us's, people lose hope. And, and when you can't survive on hope alone, 
um, without hope, life is not worth living. And so I think that when we're thinking about the practice of hope um, and we're thinking about the discipline of hope, um, there are certain routes, um, you know, certain venues and vectors that we can um, use, certain roads to walk um, in order to cultivate that hope. And part of that is um, a commitment to a multiracial mass movement um, that is really historically the only thing that has been able to beat back um, the type of white nationalist authoritarian rise that we are seeing um, in this country. So that's kind of the problem statement. Um, we were not great at that we. <laughs> we are very much so in silos now. Um, and we do not have a lot of tolerance for people. My my the example that I always give is in um, you know in, in the I have two examples. I had um, a, a junior staffer who was composing a very rapid response tweet for me um, not too long ago, and um, she wanted to use the word BIPOC, which I'm sure we all use all the time, where you know in, inside of movement spaces or in social justice spaces. Um, and it's very commonly used. And I said, uh, I want that out. Um, and if you're saying communities of color say that, if you're talking about black women say that, if you're talking about you know, Latinas say that, um, but BIPOC is something that not everybody understands. And uh, she went to basically the chief of staff and she said, you know, listen, I think we need a training because Rachel doesn't know what BIPOC means. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and of course, it's not that I didn't know what BIPOC means, but that I'm trying to message out to an audience that might not know that. The water that we swim in and the air that we breathe is very different, and there is no such thing as common knowledge. And our movements have to become much less jargony, much less litmus testy, um, much less um, uh, clubby, um, in, in, and much more inclusive, much more committed to organizing folks to get to where we need to be um, as a as a country um, and as a constituency, um, and sometimes as political identities inside of that. Um, and so, like, we cannot win as long as you know we are kicking folks out of our movement for not spelling folks with an X. Um, and I say that, you know, jokingly, but it is the, the litmus tests are very serious. And, um, and the platforms of social media um, and their disposition to um, allowing bad actors um, and people uh, who actually are very invested in misinformation and disinformation inside of our communities only exacerbates those issues. So I think that th that's hard because a lot of us have come to this work because it feels like home, because it's, you know, it's a hard road to hoe to, you know, be from, for, my, for me, you know, to be, to grow up poor, the daughter of an immigrant, you know, scrubbing floors, um, you know, never having my, my dad is Mexican, my mom is white, never having that baked in community where I could just, you know, kind of get in where I fit in. I, I, I felt like I had to build every community that I've ever been a part of, you know, um, I'm bisexual so like are you queer are you straight well both of them you know like you know and so like how are you how are you you know building that that holding that holding space that space for yourself so that you can you can have the safety to just be you but also to do this work and i think it's very hard because sometimes we can mistake our political homes for our personal homes and we can say well inside of my you know this space you'll hear at work um, you'll hear this is not, you know, this is a safe space or this is this has become an unsafe space, um, you know, that we are, you know, dealing with conflict in these ways. And the reality is, I think that we need to change our orientation on our political homes and make a better discernment between our personal homes, where we do feel safe, where we can be with people that we trust, where we can move on a, a number of multi-layered shared values versus our political homes, where we're there to build power in order to move specific political agendas. And it does not actually mean that we have to be friends. It doesn't mean that we have to be family, certainly. 
Um, and it means that, the, that that we may not be safe. Um, and the, that concept is actually relatively new inside of our movements because, you know, for many decades in this work, being involved in social justice work was a very inherently unsafe activity. Um, it's physically unsafe, um, you know, a, a very difficult and, and grueling um, action. And, and at some point we decided that our spaces need to become safe spaces for us. They're going to be a space where it's comforting and nurturing. And and what that has created is a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller movement. And um, right now, we have been losing. Um, and we've been losing for some time. And I think those two things are related because part of what is happening is that we're not big enough to, to win. And we need to bring a lot of people in and we need to keep people and we need to not um, have the expectation, I think, that folks show up fully formed. Um, and that means that to, to serve our best and highest purpose, we have to get really discerning about what we're trying to do in each space, that different spaces have different purposes, um, and how we build a tolerance for true pluralism, meaning like, can we build power with people um, that we have political agreement with, um, but that um, we may dislike <laughs> or, or disagree with on other issues and how can we have a strategy that allows us to begin to rack up wins um, and, and build power for our folks. And um, I think that part of this is that for a number of years, um, we have had in many ways um, a dearth of leadership and I, and I don't mean um, I don't mean that there have been no leaders, um, but I think that we really need to contend with our definitions of leadership and how we how we describe leadership and what that looks like for us. Because um, you know, one of the things that I found very challenging um, about um, transitioning from the role of chief operating officer at Women's March, which at the time really was an acting executive director role, like running the internal parts of the organization. And um, the actual executive director's role is that all of a sudden I was supposed to be a talking head. I was supposed to be on TV all this time. I was supposed to be on Twitter all of the time. And I think we get leadership confused with um, thought leadership or um, being a spokesperson. And for many of our organization, those, those things are the same. But I think that we really need to examine what the role of leadership is inside of the, the you know, movements that we um, cultivate. And part of that task and that duty needs to be that we make a discernment between leadership and authority or leadership and um, visibility um, because they're not the same thing. And I think that the confusion of those um, different and very disparate tasks inside of our movement spaces have caused a dearth of leadership and and what has risen in that in that kind of leadership gap has been a really intellectual and very academic view of social change which um is absolutely necessary but i think that there's a really healthy um feedback loop in a in a perfect um ecosystem between an academic view of how we achieve change and the praxis of it, the actual road testing of the of the theories. And so I think that, you know, I always tell people, very few people wake up in the morning and they say, ah, neoliberalism has food on my neck again. They say, you know, I don't know how I'm going to put gas in my car. Um, and they say, like, I'm worried that my kids, you know, who, um, you know, need, I don't know, gender affirming care, who came out as trans this year, are gonna have problems at school, and I'm not gonna be able to get the help that I need because of, um, you know, transphobia inside of our medical system. So I think we need to get much better at talking about the problems as people experience them and the challenges as people experience them and be informed by, um, you know, the, 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 intellectual parts and the academic parts, but a really true um, 
truly integrated and holistic organizing system engages the head, the heart, and the hands. And um, right now, we're very invested in being the head. We're the smartest people in the room. But um, you know, I don't know if you all have ever been actually trapped um, talking to the smartest person in the room at a party or anything like that, but it is like desperately unfun. And I go back to um, the, there was a presidential debate with George W. Bush in, and, and, one of, and he just did a, a terrible, job at the debate like he just didn't do a good job and um but there was this moment it was with john Kerry, and there was this moment and they said what is going to be the role of the first lady you know they were very this is in the specter of hillary clinton what are these what are these unruly women going to be doing inside of the white house with all this power and access and john Kerry said well you know my wife's got a 10-point plan she's got an agenda um she's she's got a strategy and he ran through it and and Bush said, you know, I really married up. And um, it's one of the smartest things I've ever done. And I would not be here, you know, talking to you right now if I was not married to my wife. He had no, there was no strategy. There was no plan. There was no vision. There was no even answer to the question. And it was at that moment that Carrie lost the debate because people do not respond to a plan and don't respond to solely intellectual pursuits. Um, and in fact, are much more um, moved by what happens you know, with the heart and the hands. And so really figuring out about how we engage our whole body, um, our whole organizing body in the tasks at hand is really important. And there are some examples of that. So I want to talk about how, how that's actually looked. Um, and very recently, I had a different example until this week. And we had a huge victory this week. And so I wanted to talk about um, engaging all of those pieces. Um, so as you know, um, the from, from, of course, the leak, now we knew that this was coming for, in some ways, many decades, but certainly many years with the court packing that has gone on. And then um, with the leak of the Supreme Court decision around Dobbs um, that effectively guts Roe versus Wade. Um, and then, of course, the decision itself that came um, midsummer. We know that we've seen a lot of activity in organizing around states um, as the ramifications of that became clear. And, um, you know, saw a number of states that would have either trigger bans on the books, which means that the second that the federal law changes, the state law changes all, you know, already, um, and then some that had to take, um, have special sessions and um, figure out how they were going to um, get those, try to move those bans into place. And um, the I mean, of, of connecting the head, heart, and hands. And um, after the Dobbs decision, which I want to say was June 24th, um, um, yeah, I think it was June 24th, um, the, the number of people, I want to make sure to get this statistic exactly right, so I am in my, in my document here, the number of people who registered in Kansas, which was one of the states that was, um, you know, had a resolution to ban abortion, who um, who registered to vote was uh, has bumped um, 1,038% after the Dobbs decision. Of that 1,038%, 70% were women. And so when we're looking at the uh, the opportunities inside of a very desperately um, painful and horrible decision that came from the Supreme Court, you know, folks got on the got on the horse right away and started organizing folks and getting the opportunity for people to to um, to register to um, have the spur turnout to get everybody you know kind of information for lack of a better word, and. And the important thing to know about this is that, you know, Kansas is not um, New York or California. Kansas is majority Republican um, in terms of registered voters. And so um, the organizing that happened here built the biggest possible constituent we. It necessarily had to go across the aisle or the victory wouldn't have happened. Just the math wouldn't math. And so when we're talking about 
how to build all of these pieces. It's like, okay, so we're taking an opportunity. That we have a, a campaign, a time-bound campaign. We want to get people involved who have a personal stake in what's going on. And, and very few people don't have a personal stake in bodily autonomy and, and freedoms. We're going to use that to make concrete change, to get more voters on the rolls. And then we're going to get those voters to turn out um, that day. And what happened um, is that, you know, the the religious right overplayed their hand and um and P and and the undemocratic nature the the way that this was not connected to the will of the people um showed up in kansas and so i have some some specific statistics i want to read out so um in the 2020 um elections we had um the, the, the Kansas Secretary of State Office confirmed that the referendum turnout was higher than any primary in state history. Um, they only have about a decade of, of, um, of data, but the 2022 referendum um, was about one third larger than the largest turnout, which was 2020, which was already the, um, itself one third higher than any other turnout. And um, the in case you don't know all of the numbers, Kansans um, by a margin of um, no votes was 59%, yes, 41, so basically 60-40, voted against an amendment that would have ended protections for abortions. And for um, the state's demographics, we've got about 26% Democrat, 44% Republican, and 30 um, other, which is um, independent. Um, and so um, this, this did not break out along party lines. And um, when you see the chart for um, new registrants for women, um, you know, the, the increase is very stark. And so the lesson I think to be learned here is that when we break our silos, when we believe um, that change is possible, not just intellectually believe that change is possible and intellectually believe in hope, but actually have a praxis of hope and a, a reasonable road to get there. So like when I, I take a lot of road trips and I'm not just like, well, I hope I'm gonna show up in Madison, Wisconsin at some point. It's like, no, I, I map my route. <laughs> I have a GPS on. I check to see my progress against the GPS. I see where I'm going to see if I'm on track or not. I have milestones. I wanna make St. Louis by a certain time at night. You know, and so having a practical route to cultivate hope, to cultivate community among people, to make the connection um, between just regular everyday folks um, and the issues that um, impact us um, leads to wins, leads to wins that can span across the aisle and build the biggest possible we. And I know that it's a little bit of a harder pill to swallow. I know that we want to talk about hope in the same way that we want to, you know, get on our practice of yoga every every week or or something like that it's like our best intentions i want to i'm going to journal i'm going to be in my gratitude journal every day and i'm gonna you know practice yoga once a week and i'm gonna stop drinking so much caffeine and i'm gonna have more political hope um and and those things are um you know living living our best lives and 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 kind of voicing our aspirations um is 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 one way but hope is actually a practical skill and a tactical skill um, that uh, is, is very different than kind of, um, you know, wanting to be our best selves, you know. Um, it is about um, making plans, executing on those plans. It's about trusting the people around you. I mean, if you look around, I would love for all you to take a pause, actually, and just look around the room, because the secret is that we have found out over and over and over again. And it's, it's actually like, I learn it all the time at Women's March when our, our organization might have issues or challenges. The reality is that no one is coming to save us. <laughs> no one is coming to save us individually. No one is coming to save us organizationally or inside of our movements. Um, and so what that means is that it's just the people in the room. So when you turn and you look and you saw those folks, this room, this people, this group, this us, this we that's right here, right now in this room, very concretely, we're the people that are going to make the change. 
and that's it. And what Kansas proves to us over and over again is that we're the people that we've been waiting for, which I know is a really like overused and, and can feel kind of trite line. Um, but that's the reality of it. We are the people that we've been waiting for. And a lot of people think, you know, hope and change. And, you know, we see these, you know, these big headlines, hope and change. And we see very skilled orators standing at podiums talking about hope and change. And if you watch movies and see the same thing, you'll think that that's actually how change is made. And actually change is not made that way. Um, change is made in your volunteer work at the midnight ride. <laughs> and change is made, um, you know, the, 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 the Montgomery bus boycotts, for example, um, you know, we hear a lot about the people who made speeches and who, who leveraged that. We don't hear a lot about the people who organized carpools or shoe drives as people actually walked the bottoms off of their shoes or flyered or stuffed envelopes or made phone calls and phone trees. But the reality is, is that those contributions moved the movement much farther than any, any speech ever has or will. Um, and, and the same thing for, you know, the midnight ride, you can, you can be whatever kind of orator you want, but if you are, you know, putting in your volunteer hours and you're doing, you know, what's necessary to, to, um, move the needle that those are the things that, that make impact. And those are acts of hope. They're not just acts of service, they're acts of hope. So I think that, um, it's important for us to just frame this correctly in our minds, and and this is part of the change I think that we that we need to make um, inside of our movements. And um, it's hard because there are problems that we're solving for. For example, climate with no known solutions. We do know some things that we can do to help, but we don't have a fix. You know, it's not like we say, oh, well, if we just do this thing, all we have to do is whip enough mo boats to do this thing, and then we're done. We have to be patient as the science evolves with our understanding of how to move the political will to implement the science, and that's hard. Um, that is a, a very difficult and uncertain world to be operating in. Um, it is it is very difficult. And that is where the practice of hope has to be um, integral. You have to understand, like, how do you get to each step? How can you practice it? How can you understand where you're at? How can I make sure that we're building the biggest possible constituent we how can i make sure that i'm taking care of myself and i'm getting everything that i need to create the safety and the security that i need to move through the world but not to mistake that for the work that i'm doing over here and the power that i'm building is people who maybe can't rise to meet those needs um you know I, I think that even a few decades ago if we ever talked to someone and said we were you know, inside of a, a, a social justice or a, a justice workspace where we were expecting safety, people would say, what are you, what are you even talking about? And while I, while I think that um, evolution is very important in the ways that we think about how we create um, more liberatory spaces, I also think that we have to make sure not to mistake our individual needs, um, which is what, you know, we get in the personal homes that we build with our needs to fight systemic oppression with systemic solutions. And that necessarily cannot be rooted in anyone's individual um, individual needs um, or, or um, definitions. And so what a feminist future looks like. Um, what I think the only sustainable future looks like is one that we arrive at via a multiracial mass movement across race, place, class, sexual orientation, sexual identity. Um, and it's the only way that we get to any freedom, um, but certainly sexual freedom, um, as we see um, so many of our individual rights, our, our privacy, um, bodily autonomy stripped away by the attacks, um, you know, from folks uh, on the far right. And so while we do have problems without solutions, we actually do have a number of solutions that we have. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that now, and then we'll move to Q&A um, because it's really early in the morning, and I'm sure y'all are fading <laughs> despite the despite the coffee and tea that i show you have um so i want to talk about some practical ideas and the first thing that i'll say is talk to a movement elder a lot of this has happened before um 
and and the, those of you who watch Battlestar Galactica, they'll say all the time, this has happened before and it'll happen again. Um, and so the way to, um, I think, understand the moment, to contextualize it, is talk to folks who are willing to talk to you um, and, and kind of help you sharpen your knowledge, sharpen your analysis, sharpen your understanding of kind of how we got here. Um, I'm very lucky that Women's March, um, one of our um, senior advisors is Barbara Smith. And Barbara Smith, some of you may know, um, and but some of you may not know because Barbara Smith has very low ego and high impact, and so has not um, played the role of, uh, you know, kind of a talking head or a spokesperson, and has instead um, remained organizing and just doing the work. Um, but Barbara Smith was one of the co-writers of the Kambahi River Collective statement, um, inside of which some of our fundamental. Um, ideas of identity politics um, and intersectional feminism were born um, inside of that collective statement. And if you haven't read it, um, it was crafted in the 1970s, C-O-M-B-A-H-E-E, -E, River Collective Statement. Um, it is just as fresh today as it was then, um, as is she. And, um, you know, Barbara, luckily for, for us and me, has poured herself into um, Women's March um, and served as a mentor to me and has really helped me to understand, um, you know, the ways in which um, we repeat patterns, the ways in which some patterns have been interrupted, the ways in which some patterns have actually been deepened um, and expanded. And understanding that and, and, and being connected to the folks on whose work we stand, on whose legacies we stand, um, is really important um, and, and very helpful and critical to have a full political analysis of the moment, without which we cannot have a full solution set. Um, so I would say talk to elders. And, and it's not just important for your own analysis, but it's important for your own fortification and your own soul. <laughs> Um, when I talk to Barbara, every time I, you know, feel myself on the ledge, I'm like, okay, I'm coming back. This is, you know, this is um, a part of something that's bigger than me, and it, it centers me. Because I think sometimes inside of this work, being egotistical can be kind of seductive. And egotistical can look different ways. Egotistical doesn't always have to look like the look at me, I'm on stage, I'm in front of the camera. Being egotistical can actually begin, can actually show up as thinking that you can be the solution, that you can play more than what your role or your contribution is. And it can actually um, start landing as pressure. I have to do this, I have to do more, I have to make the contribution that is completely outsized from my ability um, because your ego is telling you that you can do it all. And you can't. It, that, that, that kind of ego and that kind of um, impulse is related to the, cha the, the opposition that we have, it's related to capitalism and it's related to a highly individualistic um, culture and mindset. And it's, it's so important to have some way to discipline yourself and to reflect, get some good feedback from folks um, to make sure that we're practicing the kind of interdependence and feminist um, you know, kind of frame that is going to move us forward. Um, and so I really cannot stress enough find someone and talk to them. And also that means simultaneously, don't be the smartest person in the room all the time. Don't be the person with the most knowledge at any given point in time. Don't always put yourself in a position to be the most senior person, which I know we, we have an impulse to do because you know when you're the person who knows the most, um, it sets up a level of authority and it sets up a level of safety, again, to do the work. Um, it sets up power dynamics that may feel comfortable because while this part might not be in control, this part is in my control. Um, you know, and I think that really talking to elders and really putting yourself in a position to be sharpened by people who have skills that you don't have, who um, have experiences that you don't have, it's critical to the development of leadership, critical to the development of our work and our struggle for towards freedom, towards liberation, um, and, and making sure that you kind of always put yourself in that learning mode. None of us should be politically fully formed ever, ever. And that gets me back to one of the points earlier. No more litmus tests, you know, participate in making the biggest be possible. Um, participate in getting clear on shared values, but being having a lot of tolerance for, you know, the, the different ways that we may express that. Um, there are 
a lot of different um, orientations on how to do the work. And if we are um, building bases that are too small to support our ambitions, which are great um, to, to meet a great challenge, um, we just, we're gonna keep losing. And that I, I would like to make it more complicated than that, but it's just not more complicated than that. We are losing and we will keep losing unless we change behavior about how to build our movement to be bigger and stronger to meet the moment. Um, and that really means becoming discerning about where and how to find safety. So getting back to that elders, creating a space for yourself, a holding ground. Um, and, you know, I said it before and I'm gonna say it again and I say it in every speech, we need to abandon litmus tests on the left. Um, we need to stop testing people and means testing <laughs> if, um, you know, folks are, are you know, kind of uh, versed enough in our jargon, um, you know, willing enough to, um, you know, play, play roles where they're dignity or their humanity is shrunken and not expanded inside of our spaces. Um, and I think that part is very critical. I think that for many years, shame and shaming has played too large a role inside of our movements. And I think that is very antithetical to, um, you know, sexual freedom, um, freedom for, for LGBT folks, um, you know, certainly um, transphobia, homophobia, but, you know, just uh, other places for, for um, you know, uh, across the movement. Um, shame is a demobilizing factor. Shame keeps people rooted. Um, it does not keep people advancing. Um, and so the shaming that goes on for not, you know, kind of, just knowing, which no one knows, um, no, no matter what political identity you are born into, no one is born politically fully formed. Um, people certainly have different experiences, but the truth of the matter is, is that white supremacy culture, um, you know, the brutality of capitalism, um, you know, patriarchy, um, you know, homophobia, it affects us all. No matter what our identity is, it affects us all. Now, it affects us differently depending on our identity, but because it affects us all, every single one of us has a role to play in eradicating it. There, especially now, especially post COVID, post now monkeypox, um, post school shootings, post all of the damage that has been wrought by the Supreme Court. When we're talking about our movements, um, it is just really inaccurate to say, for example, for, women, for, for Women's March, it's really inaccurate to say like women and allies are impacted by Roe. There's no one that's not impacted by Roe. There's no one that's not impacted by, you know, the, what has happened to this country in COVID. We used to talk in terms of impacted communities. There's no community that's not impacted except millionaires and billionaires. And I think that we need to get very clear on who the us is and who the we is. And if we did that, it would serve us so much because there's way more of us than there are of them. And they have lost certain things that they will never get back. They've lost the culture. Public opinion is not on their side. They cannot win fair and square, so they have to cheat. So there are certain things, technology is also not on their side. Um, so while you know a post-real world is frightening, it's horrifying, it's unthinkable, and yet here we are, um, it's not the pre-real world. Um, you know, medical abortions, medication abortion, excuse me, um, is accessible in a way that was not accessible in the 70s. They can't actually stop us or control us. And so there's so much that we have going on our side that um, what we need to do is organize ourselves in a way to avail ourselves of the wins and the things that are in our favor. And I would, I think I would just end on, on these two notes before we move into Q&A is to say, Again, I think what is so critical in this time is really understanding how to take care of ourselves. I don't think that we can move forward into any work when we as people are not getting our needs met. And I think we need to understand where our needs get met and where power gets built and the difference. Um, and, you know, and, and in some cases it may be the same, but how we build political homes and how we build personal homes, the overlap um, the points of parity, I guess, and differentiation between the two um, and be very discerning about that. And then the final thing 
that I think can bring us hope, the final solution is that praxis makes the activists. Um, you know, every day um, we we take steps to getting closer to our idealized version of ourselves and our idealized version of the world, um, or we get farther away. And every choice that we make is a decision between those two things. And I think we need to understand that um, those decisions as, as you know, you think about it, if you think about it in your daily life, you know, you might go to the gym um, and you might do everything. You might sleep eight hours. You might drink, you know, eight glasses of water a day or whatever. And then you might go to Starbucks and say, ah, oh, I'm going to get the mocha. And then they say, do you want the whip on top of that? And you're like, yes, I do want the whip on top of that. And that's a choice that moves you a little bit farther away from your goals, you know, that you want. And so when you take that and you blow it up on the macro level, there are choices that we as people, we as communities, we as countries get us closer to our goals and farther away. And what we can do is practice every day making those better choices. But I think that we have to understand that one time, you know, when you when you go back to the gym the next day after you order that Starbucks in real life, they don't say you with the bad choice yesterday. You're done. You're done here. You're out. And so like every single day we have to have grace for each other and have practice, like, you know, understand that we are practicing um, the work of doing social change. And so we have to have much more tolerance for ourselves and much more tolerance for others as we are walking this road of identity, um, power building, um, you know, self-actualization, community actualization, and understand that it's not going to be linear. It's not going to be perfect. And no one, you know, is certainly going to start um, perfect. And actually, spoiler alert, no one's going to end perfect either. And so um, we really need to reject, you know, the 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 idea that, um, you know, the the way to build power is to find groups of people that we agree with 100% and to just talk to them only. And it's why we continue to get taken by surprise because we're talking to people that we only agree with. And then at the end, we're like, but the outcome was not what we thought. And it's like, well, because we were inside of all of our different echo chambers, those are different things that we have to do. And so we have to want to change as much as we want change, <laughs> going back to the cartoon um, and being really willing to be um, changed and sharpened in the service of the work um, as, as Mary Hooks from Song and M from BL um, talks about is our mandate in this time. Um, I would like to stop and take questions because it's so uh, I, I'm you know not not sharing energy and space in the room with you, um, and so I'm dying to know what's on your minds and yeah just hear hear um, what what this surfaced for you all. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, turn. If anyone has any questions for Rachel, you can come on up to the mic and we can get them to her. So come on up. Or comments. If you disagree with something I say, I'm, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> um, hello, Rachel. So sorry, let me back up a little bit there. Here. Okay, there we go. So um, my question is, um, I think a lot of times in spaces on the left, um, there's a lot of focus on, I guess, diagnosis, like you said, you know, educating people about what the problem is, what the issue is, this is a bad thing, what this is, what's going on, you know, and you see that a lot, but something, you know, I don't see that much of is, you know, like, you know, treatment, like, hey, what do you do about it? Less. I just explained in detail why your legislator is a fundamentally anti-democratic construct, but it doesn't tell you, okay, what do you do about your legislator being a fun, you know what I'm saying? So like, I, I, I don't know, it just seems like there's a lot of gaps in, okay, what do we do, you know, now? So I don't know if you knew any, like, resources directories towards that or anything like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I understand the question because the, the, the audio is a little um, difficult with the, with the Zoom. So basically, there's gaps between where we are and where we want to be and how do we bridge them. Is, is that the, the succinct <laughs> or, or is there a, a sharper version of that question? Okay, um, sorry. There are a lot of things, like this convert example, where people tell you, okay, here are the problems with our world. 
but I don't um, see many people telling you, okay, what do you, the person listening to this speech or reading this TikTok or reading this article right now, what do you do about it to fix it? You know, like no one's, I'm not seeing people telling me what to do, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So that's, I think, where we start talking about political homes. Um, I, I think it's very difficult to, um, um, and I think about this in terms of like medical terms sometimes. It's like we're, we're really good at the description you know, um, what's happening, like what, it, what's going on. But when it gets to the prescription, not so much. Um, you know, when we think about our opposition, there have been many times that there have been like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the, what, what was it? The contract with America there, you know, um, the, where there's big, bold vision. And then underneath that in different ways, um, different folks in different lanes found their, found their, you know, found their way, they got in where they fit in, you know, and maybe our role was to take over school boards and maybe ours was to continue the fight, you know, to, to gut Roe versus Wade. But I think that part of the issue is that for so long, we've been on the defense. Um, and, and that begins to be a negative feedback loop because, um, because without a bold vision, it's hard to get that kind of like um, that that th those different levels and streams of of um, work to to know what your role is, to know what your best and highest contribution is, um, without the vision of like where are we going? Because you hit what you aim for, right? But where's the target? <laughs> what are we going to aim for? And so I think that what what you know would be helpful for folks to understand how they get in between the problem and the solution is two things. One, a very clear target. What is it that we're trying to do? What is the future that we're trying to bring? When we talk at Women's March, we talk about a feminist future. And then then you have to start unpacking, well, what is feminism? Um, and like, what does that actually mean for folks? And and then how do we how do we bring that that future? And that's a 25 to 50 year strategy i mean and that and even that honestly is borderline arrogance because misogyny and 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 um sexism have been you know predate capitalism they're some of the oldest isms and so um you know thinking thinking along those terms i think you know getting really clear on the goals getting really clear on the intervention and then getting really clear on getting involved with a political home i think that people really get stuck between even if they completely understand the problem voter suppression or something that's very crystal clear and what is the solution well we could get the the john lewis voting rights um act through and 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 it would you know eliminate those protections or um we could have passed the um WIPA and abortion would be protected at the you know at the federal level there were known solutions for that but like understanding where you fit in as an individual there is very difficult outside of the prospect of a political home and too often recently political homes have been synonymous with organizations and i don't think that's necessary um i think that we can move up move outside of those realms and it, it doesn't preclude organizations obviously i run one i would love more people to be in it but i think that people can work together and make change um in many different formations um and formats but i do think the working together is critical because i think that um one of one of my my closest collaborators says all the times our means are our ends but our ends are also our means and like if we're not organizing and affecting change in a way that is interdependent with each other then i don't think that we can like bring solutions forward that are interdependent and so i think that the gap um there you know between we see the problem and understanding how to get involved with the solution is that in our minds that we need to continue to deprogram and de decolonize from this sense of like um rugged individualism even as it pertains to social justice work is that we actually don't have to have the solution we don't have to know all the things we can know and have the skills that we have and bring it to a place where they can be put to a best and highest purpose so um it just gets back to the to, to those issues of where we fall short where there are gaps the answer is almost always to lean into each other um there are very few instances where that is not the that is not the prescription to that problem. Yeah. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm actually from Kansas City, Missouri, and was heavily involved in trying to take action to prevent Kansas from removing bodily autonomy. And uh, one of the things that we found up there that we needed to kind of confront was that there were so many voters who just weren't participating in the system. And we weren't necessarily trying to change people's hearts and minds. We were trying to just get more people who hadn't voted participating. So I'm just curious, what are some of your favorite strategies that we can take home to help get people more involved in our democracy? Because we probably aren't going to change people <laughs> on the right's minds. We've just got to get people in the middle who haven't participated activated. So how do you do that? Yes, yes. That is a very sharp analysis and noticing is that I really feel like the biggest us and them um, in politics is not right and left, but politicized versus unpoliticized or organized versus unorganized or people who are active versus people who are inactive. And um, I think that one of the ways um, th there is a have you have you all um, heard of Marshall Gans? Um, he does public narrative and organizing. If you've heard of him, you could give me a give me a hand. But if not, Marshall Gans, G A N Z, he um, teaches something called public narrative. And um, public narrative is a, a a both a communications and an organizing tool, and it's a way to get people to um, into action. And um, if you Google public narrative, you'll find a number of speeches that you will absolutely recognize, um, including um, then Senator Obama's speech that he gave at the DNC that launched him into national prominence. Um, that was used that framework, um, and it's the framework of. Um, the, the way that it works is it's it's not really like prescriptive in terms of what you say, but how do you say it? Um, and the framework begins with the story of self, of, you know, how you came to the work, the story of us, which is like, what are the things that we value together? And then the story of now, which is why this moment, it's important for people to take action. Now I say that because I think that it's a, it's a helpful tool to move people into action in the way that you talked about. So I wanna offer something very concrete. So public narrative is what you could Google. Um, but I also say that to say that one of my favorite examples of public narrative is a speech that Bono gave at the National Prayers Breakfast, or the, I forget exactly what the title is. And one of the things that he was saying, he was, he was pitching for his, um, for for project one and they had such a clear call to action which was that everyone should donate one percent of their salary and 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 to eradicate poverty that one percent of of gdp um for any country should be um dedicated to eradicating poverty um and it, it, it was a, a very clear call to action um i actually don't know much about the organization so i don't know if i uh agree that that would be a good use of money but um what we're talking about is is getting people active and one of the things that he said in his speech that I found very um, engaging is that he said that um, he, for many years he was unhappy, um, you know, that he was this rock star and he was doing all this work, but he was still very unhappy and that he used to pray to God every night, um, you know, to, to, to fortify him, to get behind him, to like, you know, to, to help him out. And, um, and that he finally got some counsel from somewhere that said, you don't ask God to get behind you, you get behind like God's works. Now I'm an atheist. And so that's actually hard. Like it, it, like I, I'm not usually very open to um, a lot of religiously framed messages, but, but when I take that into my practice and my area where I feel a spiritual connection, which is with the people, um, what I, what I would say is we have to get behind. We can't ask, we cannot actually ask the people to get behind us. And I think that's a mistake that the left makes. Um, different, again, from the right, um, where the right will use anything in, in what lands in my leftist brain as opportunistically or cynically. Um, but they will use any opportunity to get where the people are at and use that momentum to get the get, you know, to build power. And so I don't think that the question that we can ask is, is how do we get more people involved with us? I think the, the question that we have to ask is, how do we get more involved with the people? And, um, and that means some tough 
processes because our organizations and our systems, our institutions don't, don't, don't ask that question. We, we very rarely have collaborative processes for budgeting or for strategic planning or for outcomes or for things like that. And so it's actually pretty hard to orient around that changed, um, you know, that changed mentality. But I do think that that's the way forward. I don't think that people will get off the couch. I don't think that people will radically change their participation in either political bases or, you know, electoral or community organizing unless organizers on, across all of those different institutions begin to ask, how do we get more involved with the people? What are their problems? You know, how are we, how are we addressing the, the real life challenges? Getting back to that question of, you know, organizations that are that are moving strategies you know have to understand that people don't wake up in the morning saying neoliberalism has its boot on my neck again but rather i have to figure out how i'm going to pay for gas this week because my my car note is also due um and i got to i'm you know i'm trying to figure out <laughs> you know as uh, you know as the lyrics go i'm trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents and so like how am i how am i doing this now inside of our you know communities we may recognize root cause of those and and name them by their academic names but until we can get with the people and until we can understand how they experience things and address those things i think that we cannot expect to see a big change in um participation so again we have to want to change as much as we want change I think we have probably have one time for one more question. Does anyone else have questions for Rachel before I wrap us up? Yes. Get the jog on. <laughs> $5 on the fridge. Um, Thank you, by the way, everything that you've said is really, uh, for those of us who do a lot of community organizing, again, hearing your words and hearing, um, you know, drawing attention to the ways that we can come collaboratively uh, to move in forward motion toward the kind of goals that we have is really important. It's interesting in the conversation, you know, as you shared about bringing people into the same room and sort of stopping some of the purity tests and dealing with the purity tests. As a community activist, one thing, and I'm a cis white male, and that's why I wanna be careful in, as we open up the movement, that we don't recenter white people and kind of how we sort of co-opt that. So I'm curious, any advice you have on how we can continue to grow these conversations, do some of the work, bring people in, but not kind of fall back to some of the, some of the systems that have essentially reinforced that oppression by centering white people, starting to go like, okay, well, we got to broaden the movement, so let's cave into a lot of things that harm the movement down the road. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it, I mean, that's about how we hold space. Um, but I mean, I guess I would argue a little bit that like, you know, I'm, a, I'm an argumentative human, I'm a Taurus, I'm gonna have to let you all know right now, and with with a Capricorn moon. So you know, I'm I can argue for days, like I'm going to I'm going to the grave with all these arguments. Um, but I would actually argue that like, we've decentered whiteness. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think that we have, um, in many ways, sharpened our analysis. But I but I think that, um, that by by creating the kind of political spaces that we have um, that have a lot of um, uh, visibility um, from, you know, from communities of color, for women, for queer folks, for trans folks or whatever, um, inside of a decades long losing strategy where we become smaller and less powerful. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure I agree that we have decentered you know whiteness and certainly we have not decentered white supremacy um you know if 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 we're really honest about it um you know thinking back on that we're we're near to the five-year anniversary of charlotte charlottesville and um you know when nazis marched on charlottesville we were shocked five years later their replacement theory messages their you know a lot of the things that at the time we were like you know the, the the country not i i say we um i don't actually include myself in that we but we the country um not we the, the individuals um you know we're shocked about those messages five years ago those messages are now mainstream on tv on fox news on you know national broadcast television in um newspapers uh, you know we just saw the gutting of roe versus wade in in many cases driven um on the right by a, a concern about the great replacement theory so 
I guess I question whether or not the you know we really decentered whiteness and 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 white supremacy um i think that there are ways in which our analysis has to be sharp enough to allow everyone to make their highest and best contribution um and that we have to um reject you know kind of making hierarchies of harm um and i think that getting really clear on um what it means barbara smith always says this thing to me like whenever i talk to her and i i on this issue you know um because we talk a lot about white white feminism people will talk about white feminism and um while i do agree that they're white feminists i oftentimes think like there are these books that'll be like and then these white feminists put up confederate you know statues all around the south and i'm like but, but those aren't feminists so those are women who are white and and exercising white supremacy um feminism is a specific political ideology a woman is a specific political class or political and social class um and so like it's important to us i think to be really sharp around that and one of the things that barbara smith always says is when i wrote the term identity politics i never thought that people would run with identity and leave the politics on the floor and what she means by that is that it mattered that she was she came she was you know poor that she was a lesbian, that she was a socialist, um, that she was, you know, anti-capitalist, um, in addition to the fact that she is black, right? And so I think that um, we cannot, we cannot um, win by sacrificing um, representation for politics. Um, and um, we should be very discerning about the way that we center people and deal with issues of visibility and issues of authority um, and issues of um, leadership um, inside of a white supremacist culture. So there's no, there's no, you know, magic bullet of saying, well, if you do this and you do that, then we won't go back to, to centering whiteness. But I just want us to be really discerning and to say, like, have, have, have we actually successfully done that? Um, and is there a way that we can sharpen our analysis and then our praxis to not just have folks, um, you know, people of color, queer folks, you know, women in visible um, positions, but also um, in change making positions, which requires us to have a, a different theory of change to, to actually make change. I think I, we're getting we're getting a time that I'm getting on time, <laughs> but um, I want to say thanks to everybody um, for having me. And if there are follow up questions or anything else that you all um, have to say, um, you can always get me on um, Twitter or any of the you know the apps. I'm around. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Rachel. It's so wonderful to have you. Um, maybe we'll get you here in person at a future summit. Um, for everybody here, uh, my name is Mandy. I'm the other Mandy here at Woodhall. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, we have another packed day ahead of us. So um, our next workshops are starting at 10 no, 10.45. Sorry about that. And then we'll come back here for lunch and our author's roundtable. Um, so we have an exciting day. I'm excited to see you all back here. We have another Vicky Award this afternoon. And then we have burlesque tonight. So. Um, yeah, caffeinate up. We have a lot to do today. Um, so thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>